intimacy. How to be intimate? Do you know how to be intimate? Now, the word sexuality, of course, is one that uh, is one of the most popular words in society, and probably from the beginning of time. But then there's another word called intimacy. What is the difference between the two? Are they the same? So I want to uh, talk about that, and it's something that we all relate to because it's part of who we are as human beings, whether we understand it or not, whether it remains, whether it remains a mystery or not. The idea of not just a relationship and not just love, but actually a sexual dimension to our love, a romantic and sexual dimension that's physical and erotic and sensual is very much part of our existence. It has filled with complexity, but it doesn't mean we can live without it. Some say you, can live with, you can't live without it, you can't live with it in a way. That's what some say. And especially in our day and age, after what they call the sexual revolution in the 60s, it's taken on all kinds of other implications and other uh, meanings. So let's talk about that. Because you could divorce the two, sexuality and intimacy, by simply saying sexuality is far more about technique, method, pleasure. With intimacy, some people actually say, I'd rather not have intimacy in my life. Sexuality, I want in my life. There are people actually feel that it's an accomplishment if you're able to have a sexual relationship but not have an intimate one. I remember a guy telling me, he said to me, I finally mastered the art of being in a relationship, a physical relationship, but there's no commitment. I'm not committed. I may have mentioned this in a previous uh, episode. And I said, does the woman know yet? He says, no, I hope she never finds out. In other words, I, and I wanted to cry. He thought he was liberated. Because at the end of the day, it's not just a physical connection between two bodies. We all know there's something more to it. And if you think about it, the healthiest form of a relationship is when there is more to it. Even if one were able to, and I'm not saying you're able to, to master the technique of getting your personal pleasure and as well as your partner's pleasure, but there's no commitment, there's no sanctity, there's no long-term relationship, there's no obligations. Would that be a healthy relationship? Would it be good for the individual? It may sound good if you think in terms of instant gratification. You know, I got my kicks, I got my pleasure, and that's it, I move on. Why do I need to have this whole complex, complex relationship and so on? But let's talk about the very nature of what we're addressing here. What is sexuality? So there are many theories posited out there. Many. Some say it's a byproduct of simply because nature and evolution dictates that we need to perpetuate the species. So it's an incentive to get two male and female, the two sexes, to connect with each other because they're incentivized by the pleasure they gain. But it doesn't have any particular role to play. The main thing is that they connect. The seed of the male seed fertilizes the female egg, and you're assured that the species will continue. It's obviously quite non-romantic, and most of us would feel there's a little more to it. I care about the person I'm with, and not just I've been there physically and then we move on. And there are animal species that are exactly like that. They may never see each other again. And they do what has to be done. And that's the, that's the whole thing. The goal was met. We talked about this a bit last week. But I'm talking about it now in the sexual context, in the intimate context. So then you could say sexuality is just a word for a biological breeding. The way biology has created us, there's a male entity, a female entity. They need to come together, whether it's due to the gene pool or other reasons. Not, we're not amoebas where we self-perpetuate. And this brings it together, seed and egg, fertilized, and there you go. I would say it leaves a lot wanting because you say, so that's the whole pleasure? The whole pleasure that we pursue sexual pleasure is simply a, 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 a trick almost to get people to breed? You'd want to think it's more than that. And I, as you know, I'm not going to go with a scientific approach in the laboratory. Of course, you can break it down and turn it into physical things, chemicals, (coughs) dopamine, other chemicals that 
arouse a person that bring that pleasure, and I'm sure you can simulate it in a laboratory. But there's something about a connection between two people that's a little more than just a two machines brought together to breathe a third machine. In the Bible, in the Torah, intimacy, uh, sexuality is called knowing. Adam knew Eve, knowing. He knew her, and she knew him. Which would suggest that it's more than just a physical act. It is a way of getting to know each other. So we can get to know each other on a superficial level. We can get to know each other on a deeper level, start speaking to each other, understanding each other's interests, how our minds work, how our hearts work, and you can actually begin to feel and long for the other. I don't just mean in a sexual way. You feel you care. And even after sex, people, two, two uh, male, female have sex, even after that there's a caring, there's a feeling of love and warmth. And it's not just the physical act. So that would be suggested in the word to know, to really get to know someone is more than just an intellectual exercise, it's an intimacy. That is two souls connecting. Not just two bodies giving each other pleasure. And when these two souls connect, there's something profound, and therefore it expresses itself in a physical pleasure. So the way the mystics would explain it would be that sexuality is the wrong word to use. The word is intimacy. And it's all about deep connection. And it's all about warmth and relationship. And the physical part of it is either the consummating or of, of that relationship or one manifestation. It's not alone. It's not divorced and separate. As much as people think it would be a good way to go because that way I would have no commitment, it actually undermines the entire experience. Because it's the experience of two souls connecting and give and have the potential and power, yes, to give birth to a new life. And that means you're touching something that the human being in the usual routines of our lives do not have the capacity to do because we cannot be creators. We cannot give birth to life. What is happening? That two souls in their deepest way are connecting. So there's, yes, there's a cognitive part of the process to people connect by communicating by feeling for each other but there's something that happens in the words of the bible that two become one flesh for how you one flesh essentially is what we call a two souls mating where they become so intertwined like one and there's something about that oneness we're actually not experiencing yourself and your needs being met it turns into becoming the greatest pleasure. That's the irony. So it seems quite bizarre and quite ironic, the other way around, that people are looking, I want my pleasure, you get your pleasure, we can do it together, great. The whole point of it is that you're going beyond yourself. That's why you'll find people who are on that height of ecstasy. It's not about thinking about themselves. They just melt into a higher reality. And precisely for that reason, it's such a mystery and such a mystique. If we try to control it, or we try to understand it, or we try to analyze it, you try to own it, you lose it. Like all great experiences of awe. You don't want to own the things that, bring, that elicit awe. You want to stand before them and melt and be absorbed, dissolve yourself in the greater experience. And intimacy is the deepest way of doing so. Two human beings with different interests, different backgrounds, come together and are able to transcend their differences, transcend their even individuality, and dissolve, absorb, and melt into one. The way the mystics put it, it's actually three forces at work. It's him, her, and the divine transcendent. It's a transcendent experience of the greatest possible way human beings can experience transcendence. And that's why it's connected to such a deep pleasure. It's not some trick of nature. It is the result of true intimate connection.
Now, I'm going to use a word. You've heard the word vulnerability. What, do you, what does that elicit when you hear the word vulnerable? Are you vulnerable? Most of us immediately, and I've tested this, react in a way, no, I, don't, I, I may be vulnerable, but I don't like being vulnerable. It makes it synonymous for many of us with the word defenseless, with the word unprotected. Vulnerable means vulnerable to people, to predators and hostile forces that can take advantage of you and it can exploit you. Children are vulnerable. They need to be protected. They need to be watched over. How would you like to hear that the ultimate love and the ultimate experience of intimacy is actually the celebration of your vulnerability? It would mean that you, at your own volition, have come to understand and relate to another person and you're ready to be vulnerable with them. Not just naked without your clothes, but naked also emotionally and psychologically and spiritually. That you're ready to allow yourself to let go. Many of us would have a lot of issues with that because when we've let go or when we didn't have control over it, we were hurt. Yes, we were hurt. It could be by parents, it could be by friends, it could be by strangers. We were sometimes violated. And I don't mean necessarily mean it in the most direct way of someone being um, violated sexually, as in rape. Sometimes violation means that someone entered your inner space without your permission and hurt you. So it's natural that we'd be very resistant to experience that, which I would submit is one of the reasons many of us Try to separate sexuality from intimacy because intimacy is too close for comfort. Sexuality, I may not be in totally in control, but I feel I'm in control. And it doesn't necessarily have to last. I don't need to be committed to that person. I don't have to. How often do we feel that once you slept with someone, someone was with someone and uh, together intimately, now goes a whole complications, expectations and um, promises and, 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 and jealousies and all that comes with it, bedroom politics. Why is that the case? Because we're afraid of being defenseless, because we're afraid of being vulnerable. And it to makes total sense, but we want the benefits. The fact of the matter is, healthy relationship is a vulnerability that you can celebrate. It's the someone that you know will not hurt you. Now, can we be hurt even by people who, who we care for and they care for us? That comes with the turf, yes, that's what love is about. When you don't have your armor up and all your defense mechanisms and your guard is down, you could be hurt. But you know what? If you have the guard up, you'll never have a relationship. So who, who has not fantasized on the idea? How can I have to let someone in only on my terms but not be vulnerable? Well, let me know when you master that art. That's like saying keeping the door open but only for those to come for, for me to go out but not for anyone to come in we'd like to believe that we can maybe fake or feign vulnerability but the other person doesn't know better i mean that's pretty sad so yes i would say that what we would like to find is someone that you can be completely vulnerable with and there's that trust and there's always the risk not because the person may intentionally hurt you because when you're opened up in that way you are in a sense like you have, you have no safety net. Now, I'm not suggesting anyone jump into a relationship of that nature, obviously. But that's what you're really aspiring to. Because when you find that, you find God. That's when they say to love another person is to see the face of God. You're experiencing the utter and ultimate transcendence. And transcendence is not a simple matter. Throughout history, you have stories of people experiencing transcendence and they didn't come back to tell about it. Or they came back and were deeply wounded because they didn't know how to internalize it. They didn't have the, that emotional and spiritual and intimate and, and, and uh, maturity to internalize intimacy. Think a moment the difference between children and adults. Children. I, 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 I don't mean in any grotesque way, but why can't children have sex with each other? I mean, besides the social mores and so on. Because they're not ready for it. It's not just a sexual act. It's an emotional relationship. 
And it's too intense for them. They don't have the containers to be able to contain it without being overwhelmed. Hopefully we turn into adults. We've matured not just chronologically, but also emotionally. So we can contain the intensity of having an experience like that with another person. Because it's not just the act. Yes, <clears throat> children can, can, can exercise the act. But it's not the relationship. And that's why intimacy is actually the greatest experience in, human, in the human experience. The ability to suspend yourself, be vulnerable, connect with another, celebrate that vulnerability together. And one of the litmus tests to know that it's working in a healthy way it doesn't just, it's not just during the sexual act. It's afterwards and before. Intimacy is not just an act. Intimacy is a state of being. They say, not sure who says, but I, I, I always thought about it this way, that for men, love is a verb, and for women, it's a noun. Is love an act or it's a state of being? So yes, we use love in the verb, make love. But being in love, a state of being, means you're not just experiencing it, you are it. That is true intimacy for men and for women. Unfortunately, in our society, men maybe began the, the distortion by trying to separate sexuality from intimacy, and women went along because they wanted to be free. You're free. Why should I be the one that remains with the risk of pregnancy or other risks? I also want to be free. Instead of the women teaching the men what intimacy is, women have followed the men into their way of separating personal relationship with the act. Well, we live in a time of crisis of intimacy because people don't know how to have relationships. No, sexuality, people can have sex. But intimacy is a far, far greater art because there you need to put yourself on the line. It's a state of being vulnerable. It's a state of experiencing that on that deeper level. I always used to think in terms of the three S's. There's a very thin line between spirituality, sensuality, and sexuality. Very thin line, and you see it. Why? Because all of them are about letting go of the material layers, crusts, that conceal who we truly are. So spirituality, of course, is getting becoming more soulful, Sensuality, what is sensuality? It's not something you quite you sense and touch. It's a place where touch reaches and touches something that's beyond touch. What is a human touch? When you touch someone that you really love, even a slight touch, it has that electricity because it's physical touch, but it's experiencing something beyond the physical. And sexuality is, of course, in the full-blown form of it. So really, it, what, really what it comes down to is the search for unity. But I don't mean it on a level of physics or science or theology or philosophy. I mean it on a personal, to experience personal unity. Feeling you completely belong. That in that moment, you're completely absorbed, together with the person you love, in a sacred way, in a sacred union. So most of us don't even think of the word unity when we, when we talk about sexuality and intimacy. But that's what it's about. How to be intimate? How to be intimate is getting in touch with the innermost forces inside your life. Not being afraid to go there. To not worshipping the material surface of life, material belongings, the externals, but really feeling the essence of who we are. We're not physical beings on a spiritual journey. We're spiritual beings on a physical journey. As you connect to your own soul, which is your deeper purpose, that is an intimate experience. When you connect that with another person and both of you connect on that level, you're being intimate. So it's not just a negotiation, it's not just we're talking about even important things. We're able to look at each other eye to eye, heart to heart, soul to soul, and experience, yes, a melding, a type of fusion. A fusion with something that is greater than the sum of the parts, greater than each of us. I have no doubt that this resonates. Resonates with me. 
I'm assuming it resonates. The qu- big challenge and question is, okay, beautiful, but how do we get there? Well, the first step is, interestingly, is not necessarily working on a relationship. It's working on yourself. A relationship with yourself. Can you be intimate with yourself? Which means, can you be honest with yourself? Can you put aside all your prejudices and biases and preconceived notions and just be naked, honest, nakedly sincere with yourself? Where do I stand Don't get trapped in the pride of just feeling I have to be right. I'm able to be comfortable with myself, even with my flaws or faults. Many of us are afraid of doing that. It's very frightening because you want to embrace the thing you like to project or what you think you're projecting, which you may not be. That type of honesty with yourself is the first step because you are by definition, becoming a more intimate person. Why are you here in this world? Are you living up to your calling? Have you betrayed yourself? These are important questions to ask. When you ask those questions, then when you have a conversation with another person, that is where you're looking for. You're not just looking for a handsome or beautiful man or woman. You're looking for someone that you can have a conversation on that level. When I say conversation, again, I don't mean philosophically. I mean just a bonding of things that are not tangible, things that are more ethereal, the sublime. That is the intimate journey, getting to know another person intimately. And when you do that and you connect and you sanctify that union, what happens then, and that's why in Judaism you call it marriage, kedushin, you're sanctifying the union. The intimacy is not just of connection it permeates all of us including the physical so the physical now goes along in this intimate journey of that total fusion and you experience something that's greater than the individuals there's nothing more powerful in life than an intimate moment like that and that spills over that's not just when two people are together physically the next morning the next day at work because it integrates your life. It's the antithesis to fragmentation. Sexuality without intimacy is going to be fragmented. It may be good for the moment during that time, but does it give you peace of mind? Can you go to work in peace? Are you fraught with jealousies and other thoughts? Whether there's real commitment? What is he thinking? What is she thinking? When it's intimate, it becomes a type of fusion. Yes, you celebrate your vulnerability, and you know what comes back in turn? An invulnerability that cannot be achieved in any other way. Because you've connected to something that is indestructible. You can try to be tough and try to be strong and all that, but at the end of the day, it's only as strong as you are. This allows you to connect to something, to a lifeline, to a force that is beyond our own strengths, And vulnerability, ironically, leads to invulnerability. There's so much more that can be said on this topic. Check out my chapter on intimacy in the book, Toward a Meaningful Life. It's a really interesting chapter. I've not heard from many people what kind of impact it has had. It definitely heightens the standards that most of us have of what we're capable of in loving another and being loved. So... Good luck on this journey of intimacy. We live in a time where there's an, a big need to be able to truly discover what intimacy is about. There's a lot of cr- crisis in this area, whether it's divorce or the relationships that are very fraught with all kinds of dysfunctionality. Intimacy is the way to go. So good luck, my friends. It's a journey, but it's an exciting journey. And may you be blessed to be able to find that intimacy within yourself and share it with another So we're here every Sunday, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. It's been great talking to you all. And have a beautiful day. Or if this is another time zone for you, a beautiful night, a beautiful morning, a beautiful afternoon. And let's all be a little more intimate, I think, during this time of quarantine and semi-quarantine or whatever you call it, this pandemic. I think many of us have turned a little more inward. So let's use it well. Great. 
talking to you, Simon Jacobson here. Be well, share, like. You can as you can uh, communicate with us in any way through Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, all the different platforms. Be well, guys. Bye.